I was very keen to come and, uh, partly because I, I, you know, like all good people, I've switched my allegiance to Germany. I was very keen to, to come and, uh, and discuss the translation with Gregor when he was working on it. But I wouldn't say he was keeping me at arm's length, but eventually he allowed me to come. Uh, you know, and I expected him. I, I've, the book's been translated into several languages, and I've, each time I've, you know, tried to help the translators. Um, but Gregor's queries were nothing to do with any of the obscure cultural references with which the, and, and linguistic terms with which the text is studied, but were almost always, in fact, corrections <laughs> of my text. <laughs> <laughs> and when, it was when he'd gone on to about the fourth or fifth correction in the text that I realized why he didn't really want to see me. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's not quite as bad as my French translator, Jean-Francois Kleiner, who looks at me ra rather the way that uh, Salieri looks at Mozart <laughs> in the film Amadeus. It's just, he can't quite conceive of how such a yahoo has written these books that he's spent a considerable proportion of his life translating. <laughs> But it's close. It's, <laughs> uh, uh, I knew you were partial to German. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, flattered that you would, would see it this way. Uh, let, let, let me talk about, uh, let, let, let us talk about uh, a little bit about your recent uh, sort of publishing activities. Um, uh, you, um, uh, and I'm sure you're all interested in this. Uh, you you um, gave a lecture at Oxford last year uh, entitled The Death of the Novel. Uh, this time whoa, 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 it's Gregory, it was something never like that. It, this is the Twitter sphere we have to cope uh -huh. with. Uh, people love this phrase in England, the death of the novel, because they can it becomes part of a kind of curious literary news cycle that they can, goes yeah. round and round again. No, it was in fact called a care home for novels. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The <laughs> so I wasn't yeah. suggesting that the novel was dead. I was suggesting that it was... A valetudinarian, let us say. I see. Yes, uh, um, uh, this uh, uh, destroys my entire line. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, go on, go on. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job, though, isn't it? <laughs> now you have to correct it. Here's what I was going to say. Here's what I was going to say. Uh, so uh, so uh, the, the, if the novel is, is, is going towards extinction in one way or another, and... Uh, uh, the uh, the care home is is the last uh, step uh, uh, here. Um, uh, uh, yet yet uh, you uh, you keep writing novels and uh, and of course uh, you're not talking about any novels. You're talking about difficult reading, anstrengende uh, uh, literatur, uh, books that you have to uh, uh, books that that you have to uh, work through uh, in in a in a way and engage in. Uh, uh, intellectually, critically, uh, and and so on, and yet uh, you are you are uh, uh, writing uh, these these very novels uh, right now, and uh, so I th I thought uh, this uh, this uh, sounds a little bit like you uh, switched on the literary uh, doomsday machine, and uh, and you you're sitting on the missile uh, uh, towards extinction, uh, enjoying the ride. Well, like Slim Pickens in Doctor Strangelove, uh, in Kubrick's film. Curiously, like everything Kubrick did, I don't know if you've seen Doctor Strangelove recently, it's really not funny at all. Uh, you know, it's kind of, it's like the unfunniest comic film ever made. I mean, uh, anyway, that's a digression. Yes. But it's like all his other movies, they're all perfect, but kind of wrong in some fundamental sense. Anyway, we won't get bogged down in that. Uh, yeah, can I just pursue my analogy? The novel maybe is venerable, uh, and like all... It's relatively venerable for a cultural form. It's not that old. It's only really, you know, a couple of hundred years old. So it's not that old. It's about the same age as the symphony, actually, which is a form mm. that I think it's very close to. Uh, I don't think it's going to die out altogether, partly because of the extended lifespans that people are all uh, enjoying at the moment <laughs> with concomitant problems like a crisis in care homes, um, the novel will probably live on in its care home for quite a long time, sopping up its children's capital uh, 
uh, and, you know, requiring a lot of social care. But I don't think it's going to die just yet. I mean, it is, it's a great form. And the symphony hasn't died, but it no longer has real cultural centrality in that way. And I think that's all I'm saying, that in a wired and a web world, the novel cannot have cultural centrality. That's all. So, uh, so you, you, do, do you expect yourself uh, then to be a sort of a, a museum piece eventually uh, in, 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 in that well, sense? Well, I think all of us who, you know, and I was talking about this in the panel discussion earlier today, but I think all of us who have what Marshall McLuhan called Gutenberg minds, all of us are museum pieces mm -hmm. to some extent. Just interrogate your own, everybody who's much over 40 in this room, just interrogate your own sense of what constitutes being cultured, what constitutes being an educated person. It is solely related to the construction of the personal canonical through memory. That's what we did, that's what our education was. We learned a lot of text. And it's simply no longer required. Any, there'll be a lot of people here who teach in universities, I'm sure, German education being fundamentally more robust than it is in the Anglo-Saxon world, that this barrier is being held more closely. But certainly in the English-speaking world, uh, young people simply do not have to build personal canonical knowledge in that way. The nature of an education is changing. And the novel form relates fundamentally to that culture. It really does. And it relates fundamentally to the physical codex not to the digital platform. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I sometimes I feel that I'm like a kind of negative politician, kind of going around on the stump to tell people something they don't really want to hear. I question myself, I say, why do you have to say it? Everybody's very happy pretending the novel's going to go on forever. <laughs> and everybody's very happy saying things like, oh, I only read books. I love the smell of books and the feel of them. Don't you love books? <laughs> like there's some, you know, sexual object that they're actually going to be engaging in frottage with later that <laughs> evening. I do not love books, actually. I love literature. That's what I love. And I'm sure literature will continue. But it's not going to continue in book form or in a skewer morph, which is what a digital book is. It's the recapitulation of a previously existing form as an element of luxury or design within a new medium. Uh, you know, so maybe, I know it's not popular, I know it's not what you, you want to hear, but that's tough. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh, it's also the uh, the uh, sort of the age bracket uh, we're addressing. Uh, you 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 talk about your uh, children uh, sometimes as uh, digital natives, of mm. course, and uh, and the way they are uh, dealing uh, uh, with it, uh, the way uh, they are connected to the uh, me medium uh, is is very different. And uh, you seem to think that's perfectly okay. That's their world. They're growing into it. Uh, they're they're navigating it, and and that's all fine. What about the, the 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 sort of people in between the the, the tweeners uh, uh, here uh, who are maybe struggling to uh, yeah I don't know find acceptance in the established uh, literary world uh, uh, yet uh, are trying to uh, to to live uh, the the contemporary life. I feel for saying? them. I think. I think. It, no, I do. It's really difficult. I'm too. I'm too old to to change my ways. I don't have any intention. Mm. It's not an issue for me to go on writing novels. I accept that. That it, it's very interesting. I mean, you think if you, you know, it's like when Welbeck, the French writer, received his Pléiade edition a year or two ago. You know, that's the canonical imprimatur for a French writer. That Pléiade bring out your works in this kind of ornate, gussied up form. That's like, that's like the afterthought of literature, really. It's, it's not even going to be happening to the writers of the next generation. Mm. They'll be beau livre, but there'll be no call for such things. Uh, I feel for them. It's a very difficult thing. But just, you know, to backtrack a bit, in case anybody thinks I'm kind of, you know, in case your inclination is to see the culture we inhabit as simply continuous, as just flowing through like some kind of river... Consider that in the, in the English-speaking world, or in England specifically, there was enormous agonizing over the loss of the classical education. 
You know, the idea that to be a well-educated and cultured person, you had to read and write Latin and Greek, as well as English, and a European language as well. And that simply is not the case anymore. There are plenty of perfectly well-educated people in England who do not have Latin and Greek in a European language. They just don't. But nobody... But curiously, that kind of agonizing has died away. There has been... And I'm sure there are similar... There is a similar kind of measurement of what it is to be cultivated or cultured in the German-speaking world. These things change. People aren't going to get stupider because the culture changes. They're going to be different. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe maybe it's always uh, been a little bit of a fiction uh, with the, uh, the the languages, uh, uh, the the uh, classical uh, education. Uh, the uh, the world's most famous uh, linguist, uh, Noam Chomsky, only speaks two languages, uh, and uh, one of them is computer code, <laughs> <laughs> and the other one is Italian. It's one is Italian. Yeah. So, um, so maybe that's that, that. That's always been a little bit of a fiction, anyway. Um, we were talking earlier, um, and I asked you, uh, or, or I, I ventured a generalization about your work, uh, uh, about uh, life and death, mm. and uh, you gave me a very skeptical look, and uh, and postponed the answer. Okay. And, and so maybe let let me just uh, briefly repeat. Yeah, you better had. Uh, <laughs> what I, I don't think they're telepathic. But what, I was, <laughs> what I was trying to uh, uh, trying to uh, say was uh, that I felt uh, uh, that that a lot of uh, uh, Will Self's work uh, deals with uh, death as as an element of life, and life as an element of death. Uh, that uh, so the idea being that you can be stone dead. With your heart still pumping, and you can be uh, 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 in the in the in the in the in the final moments of your life, you can be headed towards death, of, as we are all are, of course, but more immediately, and uh, and experience uh, life uh, to to the fullest. And uh, of course, uh, you you've written a book called How the Dead Live. Uh, your uh, your uh, protagonists are called the deaths uh, in in Umbrella. Uh, 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 Joyce in Leberknödel is uh, a terminal cancer patient who is uh, uh, has booked uh, a rendezvous with death in Zurich. Uh, uh, I've 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 read uh, references to zombies and the undead in in your uh, uh, lectures. And then, of course, there's also in Umbrella the encephalitis uh, patients who, uh, uh, while alive, uh, are like dead. Mm. So, so this, it, this, this mixing of the spheres is what interested me. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are several things going on with that. There's a biographical strand to it, inevitably. Uh, you know, I, the first story I published, the first one in my collection, uh, The Quantity Theory of Insanity, which you read the first line of, the North London Book of the Dead, you know, was uh, inspired by my experience of my mother's death. Uh, she died when I was 25, 26. And um, it was also her death that enabled me to become a writer. Mm -hmm. You know, she kind of, her death liberated me from her criticism which was <laughs> profound. I mean, not in a bad way. She was an extreme, she was a brilliant woman and mm -hmm. had a, 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 a fearsome critical eye. And I think in a way, she represented for me the kind of tyranny of the canonical, you know, mm -hmm. the, the anxiety of influence. She was extremely well read, very cultured woman. Uh, and, you know, I, I still mourn her, but, you know, I'm kind of grateful she shuffled off when she did. It's one of the great paradoxes. She, she raised me to be a writer. She trained me to be a writer. But it was her death that enabled me to mm -hmm. become a writer in an important sense because we were locked into a very, very, uh, frankly, I mean, not sexually, but emotionally incestuous relationship. So, you know, that's kind of interesting mm -hmm. for me. And I think her death, just in terms of, of, of uh, since it began my literary career, uh, I've been exploring the meanings of that bereavement in various ways throughout my writing. 
So that's the personal level. The kind of more philosophic and political level are, you know, there's a philosopher in England called Simon Critchley, and he says we shouldn't even speak of life and death. We should call it life death. Well, I mean, you could probably do that in German, where you're quite happy to have <laughs> odd compound <laughs> nouns, but um, it doesn't sound so good in English. It sounds like some kind of like life choice, life death. No, I don't think I'll have that. Um, but it, what I think he's trying to emphasize here is that there is something in Western thought and in the Western tradition that is very death denying. It's very death denying. And if you look at, I mean, Paul Gregor has had to just translate, it's really a novella, this novella Leberknödel, which is about this woman, English woman, going for an assisted suicide at, at Dignitas. Um, you'll be kind of, immer we were discussing it because he's just working on the translation. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't mind plot spoilers. What happens to this woman is she, <laughs> she goes to Dignitas, she goes into the little room with the, you know, watercolour of the Alps on it, and she's handed the foaming beaker of uh, sodium barbitol, and she thinks, no, actually, this is a bit early. And what then happens, rather obscurely, through some kind of weird encounter with some rather uh, zealous, uh, you know, religious Catholics who believe that a miracle has occurred, is that she has a spontaneous remission. Uh, in her cancer, and she kind of lives on in Zurich, in Switzerland. Uh, but it's an odd kind of life. Like a lot of life in Switzerland, it's a kind of living death, really. <laughs> um, uh, and Gregor was sort of saying, at lunchtime, was sort of saying, no, but she's alive and she's enjoying things. She has sex again, you know, doesn't she? It's not that yes, much yes. fun, though, is it? Uh, you know, all these kind of things happen to her and she's kind of alive. And I was saying, no, 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 no. That's not what the story's about. The story is about when you've had your time, you've had your time. You can't actually say no to the foaming beaker of sodium barbitol. You've had your time. And I think that's a real problem for Western culture. It's a problem for particularly our religious faith. With, uh, and I, uh, You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I should imagine most of the people in this room are humanists, and some will be Christians. To me, you're ideologically and religiously exactly the same. Humanism is just an offshoot of, of Christianity, and both of them are religions that have real difficulty in, in coping with death, unlike Eastern religion, for example, which is deeply comfortable with it. So I think that, you know, from a philosophic point of view, my preoccupation with death in my fiction is simply an attempt to correct that imbalance, mm -hmm. to correct a, cult uh, a cultural bias against the acceptance of the totality, the reality, and the way in which death adumbrates life at every turn. That's all. Do you want to read uh, from Shark now? Yeah, okay. Yeah. How, how do you feel? Does any people Does like another good? reading? Yeah. yeah. You're only saying that because I'm <laughs> tall and look capable of violence. <laughs> 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 I assure you I'm not. Um, so, yeah, as Gregor mentioned, this is part of a projected trilogy. The first two books are... Uh, uh, and Olivia here in the front row uh, just announced to me before the event that she just finished Shark, the second book in the trilogy, uh, and I asked her how she found it, and she said, slightly unsettling. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to be putting on the paperback in order to <laughs> shift copies. Olivia McDonald, slightly unsettling. Very. Oh, did you say very? <laughs> I'm so, you should have done. Yeah, if only you'd say very. I'm fainting with your damn praise. Um, uh, so this trilogy, the idea behind it really is that uh, there is some kind of numinous, but for all that profoundly real linkage between technological advance, pathology, illness, and the individual. And like a lot of my fiction, it takes flight from a what if. What if there were one individual who embodied in their own pathology this technological change? 
And in the first book, in Umbrella, uh, this is set against the background of the First World War. And in the second novel, Shark, it's set against the backdrop of the Second World War with special attention to the Hiroshima bombing. And the third novel will deal with what I think of as the Bush-Blair Wars. Uh, well, starting really with Desert Storm, Bush Senior's War, and moving through uh, the, the wars that were intended to ensure liberal democracy in the Middle East.